of uh, Tobias Kippenberg. And uh, I belong to the, part of, um, to the part of the group who don't um, use optics. So today we'll switch gears a little bit and talk about simulation of uh, microwave circuits. And uh, so I'm going to talk about the, the, this software that we're using to simulate a circuit called uh, Sonnet. Um, <clears throat> so here is a picture of um, the, the kind of uh, circuit uh, we're using, some, some, uh, um, you know, some portfolio uh, picture. Yes? I mean, it's, it is a beautiful picture. I understand you want to see it. <laughs> Good? Um, <clears throat> so, so here what it is. This is, this is of course, just uh, uh, nothing to do with this. Just a pencil tip for the, for the size. But this is the circuit we're interested in. So uh, what we're working with are um, some, some, circuit, uh, some aluminum circuit, which are deposited on, uh, on a sapphire substrate. So this uh, shiny transparent thing is a sapphire, and this is all uh, aluminum. And um, the basic idea is that you have this uh, central uh, transmission line, which carries some microwave signal um, over on each side. We, 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 uh, we have some wire bonding. We connect with some connectors, and we just uh, send in some, some signals, and then uh, we couple inductively to this small circuit. So here it's maybe a little bit more complicated than the most simple you could imagine, but uh, there's some uh, wires which are just kind of folded, which are some, some inductors, and then uh, two capacitors. One which is just some kind of finger capacitor, uh, nothing very special happening. And then one capacitor which, if you zoom in, and you look at some uh, SEM picture, sorry, you, you'll notice that it's um, some uh, small, about uh, uh, 20 micron in diameter, parallel plate capacitor. And the top plate of this capacitor is suspended, and then um, vibrations of this capacitor will modulate the, the capacitance, and then modulate the, the resonant circuit. So we're interested in... Um, the physics, uh, so uh, of course it's of the mechanics, so, but the, the physics of interaction between the microwave mode, which is the resonance of this LC circuit, and the uh, mechanical oscillation. So now if I take a um, similar but slightly simplified circuit and, and model it, uh, I, I get something like this. So this is the same circuit, just with a single, um, a, a single capacitor. Um, and so, okay, what we have, we have this transmission line, which is just some kind of two parallel uh, uh, wires on which signal can propagate. And then we couple to our circuit through some uh, mutual inductance M. And then our circuit is really just, or can be modeled as just um, uh, an inductance L in series with uh, capacitor C. And then the capacitor, of course, will be modulated by some uh, displacement. And in principle, at least in this model, where we reduced all the complexity uh, uh, of our circuit, which has uh, wires going different directions, to, to a, a simple um, lumped element model, where different parts of the circuit are just represented by a single quantity, which will give me uh, some, some uh, impedance. Um, so in principle, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm able to extract most of what I need uh, um, to, to understand my circuit just with those three uh, parameters, L, M, and C. So the resonance frequency of an LC circuit is 1 over square root of LC. And then you, you, you can tell, of course, that if C is modulated, the resonance frequency will be modulated. And for instance, another quantity of interest um, is the coupling of my circuit to, to, the, um, to my um, uh, transmission line where I can send in and read out information. 
And this is uh, given by this, m square over 2L square C, Z naught, which is the impedance of the line. Yes? Uh, how is M defined? What is M? So M is the mutual inductance. So, ah. so the point of, uh, uh, so the inductance tells you that, you know, if you have a current through a wire, um, uh, um, at the, this current, so if you have the derivative of a current, it creates a voltage and a mutual inductance. If uh, some other wire with a, with a current, it will create a voltage on your, uh, on your other wire. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so in principle, it's this simple, at least in this model. In fact, it's not quite so simple. I'm going to talk a little bit more about how uh, this whole approximation breaks down in the second hour. But now let's just say that uh, um, you could, of course, want to, 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 to estimate uh, all those parameters, but uh, in fact, it is quite useful to simulate the, the, actual, um, the actual device. And for this, uh, we use the software, so I've just taken a, an example picture from, from their website. So uh, Sonnet is some, some uh, program that, that's used to really just to simulate circuits. So some kind of planar geometry on some substrate where you send in a uh, current inside and you're wondering what will happen. Um, so what is it useful for? Here we see it, it's, it's uh, looking at some kind of uh, uh, design which I, I, don't, I don't really understand. So a complicated design to create a, a low pass filter that transmits at a lower frequency and it cuts off. Uh, I mean, so any kind of different microwave filters, uh, antennas, uh, you can try to simulate with Sonnet. And so before I start to try and show you how the software works, I'm going to say a, a few words, but just a few words about um, the, the, the ideas how, how Sonnet works, what is it trying to do. Um, and so, um, okay, so this is a picture taken from um, um, basically the, 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 the article um, that came out in 87 to, to so when they, when they just uh, started. So, so there's this uh, JC Rousseau and he did his PhD thesis on exactly this and he founded the company uh, um, and so you can find the, the paper from back then. And the idea is that we model our all I, uh, our whole system as um, so we have we have our substrate and our circuit and we just put it inside a metallic box and now the point is that we know exactly what happens in um, so there's some kind of boundary which is which is our um, our plane which is the surface of the substrate where there's some uh, bunch of wires in which we'll, we'll send currents. But in, in the two kind of um, uh, parallelipiped uh, shapes, on either side we know exactly what's going to happen. We have a box filled with dielectric uh, and so we're going to have some, some modes. And the idea is that you can in a way solve exactly this problem by uh, um, by checking how much uh, energy uh, will be in each of the modes of the box, of the boxes on either side, and you just have to fix the boundary condition. And the boundary condition is that, you know, there is some kind of metallic shape in which there is going to be some current, and, you know, if you have a current on a, on a surface, it fixes the boundary condition where you have to have a jump in the uh, magnetic field from one side to the other, and so you can solve this problem. And then, what does Sonnet do? Well, Sonnet knows how to link, uh, um, you know how to link currents on this surface to, to the modes, which will, will tell you how much field in the end, how much electric field there is uh, at this boundary. And this gives you some kind of big linear problem with some big matrix. And what we actually want to do is the inverse problem. We don't know the currents, but we know some, some boundary condition. We know that there's going to be uh, on the side of the box at some place uh, um, a port in which we, we force a certain voltage. So we send 
we, we force a certain field, and everywhere else the field should to go to, to zero, and we, we want to know how much current there is. And so, uh, you know, when you, when you hit um, analyze a button inside Sonnet, it takes this big matrix, it takes a, a lot of, of, uh, of, uh, of currents, it inverses the matrix, and it finds what's the, going to be the, the current distribution in the system for, for, you know, a given voltage applied at the different ports. Yes? And this will take account of moving parts, so the mechanical parts? No, no, so this is, this is static. So the mechanics will have to think a, a bit uh, how we want to t take it into account. Uh, I'll, I'll mention it a bit later, but this is just a static box. Yes, we, are, yeah, we, we you cannot not yet model or simulate your So okay, uh, I'll tell you quickly how we do it. So so how we do it is that uh, so we can we can we can have just multiple layers of metal. It, it it's like two and a half dimensional. So so this is the simplest model where there's only one layer of metal. You could imagine that you have multiple layer process to different dielectrics. So you what you can do is just have one more layer when you have this this metal, and basically you can simulate this and then check how the <coughs> characteristics of your circuit depend on the height of this layer, which is really the height at which your, your drum sits. Um, so, so now you, you can tell there's a little bit of difference with, with what uh, a program like uh, Comsol does. So this is not technically finite element. We don't take the uh, uh, differential equation uh, uh, over space and then just uh, um, mesh our space to, to approximately solve the equation. So the space where there's the Maxwell's equation that happened are those two cubes and we solve exactly the problem there because we know how to break the problem down in terms of, of, uh, of wave and like standing waves and modes. The approximations come from the, the boundary condition. So what, what, what is going to be the approximation in, is we have this, this complicated circuit and to simplify the problem, we're breaking down in small squares where current can only flow one way or the other. And so, in a way, we simplify the, the problem looking at uh, kind of more simple circuits where there's less uh, ways in which the current can flow, but then we solve exactly uh, uh, the problem by, by doing the sending wave. And of course, you know, what, the other simplification of boundary condition is the fact that we put into a certain uh, uh, volume, right? Like say, our actual sample, since it sits inside a, a, a metallic box, just to be shielded from the environment, but a very large box. In fact, in our simulation, we'll move the boundary close to the circuit we're interested in, just because we don't want to, to simulate something too big. So uh, the point is that we solve exactly a problem, which is a simplified version of the problem we're, we're uh, actually interested in. So, uh, with this very short introduction, uh, unless you have some, some more uh, abstract question how uh, Sonnet works, then we'll start uh, try to play with the software. Um, so, let me switch to, to the program. And so, uh, so, this is going to be a first simulation, which is just uh, drawing a very, very simple uh, uh, capacitor and just do everything from scratch from the program. And just to prove to you that it was possible to install it uh, on a Mac through Wine, so uh, I did it. So I have, in principle, Sonnet Slide should launch. Here we go. So, um, so okay, let's try, to, let's try to do this. Uh, so so we open this, and then the first thing we're going to try to, to do is just uh, open project new geometry to have this kind of uh, 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 main, main window for the, for the for Sonnet. <coughs> okay, and so, okay, the first thing before we try to draw is just to, to uh, define uh, um, the, the different uh, units and things we need. So, okay, first step we're going to do is choose units. 
And uh, here I already set uh, two microns, which is the, the most natural units for, for us here. And OK, you have also units for inductance and capacitance in nanohenry uh, picofarads, which are going to be useful, which, which uh, makes sense. Okay, well, can you use magnifier? Sorry? Um, uh, let me, so because the text is small, well, what's the problem? Uh, yes, so, I, okay, so the, what I wanted to do, yeah, so the presentation, I thought like, okay, now, you know, it's going to be bigger picture, so the, the relevant text should be big enough, so it, here, here it's, so the, the problem is finding, so okay, so what I also put is, is where in the menu to find the thing, because it's always going to be some, uh, something up there. Is that okay? Uh, Make it full screen. Maybe. Which full screen, this? Both, and then you can just use but but the, this size, the size of the text won't, won't, won't change. You see what I mean? Uh, it's, it's not, I mean, okay, this is, <laughs> In a way, part of the problem of Sonnet is that I don't think they changed much the design since uh, 1987. Um, so yeah, some some things are a little bit. Uh, okay, <laughs> if if you if you. Okay. It's fine. It's fine. On, on the right, we can always know where it is in the menu. Yeah. So so normally I try to put the relevant things here at the bottom and and and, and put it. So if you have any any doubt, just ask me. Uh, I'll try to go from there, and if it's really problematic, uh, I'll try to, to change. Um, okay, very good. Now, um, so so so, how does it work? So we have this we we have this space where we're going to draw our thing, and uh, so this is the two dimensions, and the vertical dimension is is represented here. Here we have uh, some kind of two dielectric. Uh, layers in between we're going to sandwich uh, our, our metallic circuit and so what we have to do is to define one ki what kind of dielectric those two things are and so uh, if we go to circuit uh, dielectric layers uh, we can just define those and so I'm going to uh, how does it work to double click on the bottom layer and this is going to be our uh, uh, sapphire um, which in our case is about uh, 525, uh, no, uh, oh yes, 525 microns, sorry. And uh, so really what, so in fact sapphire is an, as an isotropic uh, material, but uh, so we would like to, to pick different a dielectric uh, uh, constant for different direction, but this is not allowed in uh, sunlit light. So we'll just pick the same. It does not matter uh, so, so much for the, the kind of simulation we're going to do. So uh, we're going to put 9.3 for the dielectric constant and uh, 1 to the e minus 7 uh, for the dielectric loss tangent, represents the uh, imaginary component of the uh, dielectric uh, constant, which is some, some uh, uh, dissipation within the material. So this is going to simulate a little bit um, the, the, the losses. I mean, it's a, quite an incomplete model and it will, of course, grossly underestimate the losses, but uh, yeah, it's already something. Uh, very good, and then the top layer, so we double click on that, uh, it's just going to be air or vacuum. Uh, um, I mean, it's, we can put it one millimeter, so 1,000 micron, and, and just a dielectric constant of one. Okay? And now, um, the second... Uh, so now we have our bottom dielectric sapphire, our top dielectric air. And the second step is going to, to, to set up what kind of, of metal. I can put a uh, different part of the circuit, different metals, but what kind of metal? So I go to circuit uh, metal types, and I'm going to add uh, a new kind of metal. So add uh, planar, so add a, a metal type for the planar. 
And this is going to be our um, superconducting uh, aluminum. And so uh, we have different models which we can pick to put the different characteristics of the metal. And we're going to pick uh, general. And actually, what we would like to do, uh, since um, um, uh, superconducting material, especially uh, thin ones, they have, uh, uh, they have some kind of intrinsic inductance called uh, kinetic inductance, which is char characterized by this uh, uh, constant LS. And this is just because there's a finite number of, of, uh, um, of Cooper pairs that carry, uh, uh, um, uh, carry charge. And um, this is really the kinetic energy of those. Except that uh, uh, you, in standard light, you cannot put a value to this. So we'll have to, to keep it uh, to zero for the simulations here. But in, in fact, it should, it should be something like a 0 0.01, 0 0.02 uh, of a pico, pico Henry per some square unit. All right? So now we could draw, uh, uh, we could start drawing a metal circuit. And the final thing we have to do before that is just uh, define the basic unit of our problem and how big we want our uh, metal box to be. And for this, we go to circuit box. And so I'm going to pick, uh, we're going to pick quite a small box so that uh, uh, we can draw a very simple circuit that can be simulated uh, uh, from a sunlight light without, um, without a license. So, uh, so the example, we put uh, 200 microns by uh, 200 microns, and then um, the smallest, uh, the smallest cell, so the smallest feature that can be resolved is going to be uh, one micron uh, by one micron. Um, that's it. Okay, so now we have uh, we have this box. And, and we should be able to start uh, drawing. Wait a second. Okay. And so, okay, what we're going to draw is <laughs> you know, basically a cartoon, a cartoon version of a, of an inductor. So just some 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 two lines that come from the top and bottom and uh, uh, some uh, horizontal things. So to draw uh, any metal, uh, we're going to go to tools, add metallization, <coughs> and draw rectangle. And now uh, we can just uh, kind, of, kind of draw our circuits. And so um, as we just uh, created some metal, we can move it. and. If we double click it, we can choose what type of metal it is. So there's the basic lossless uh, metal, which comprises the, 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 the boundary of the box. And there's just uh, superconducting aluminum, which is in fact exactly the same, but it could be something different, um, which we just defined. And we're going to pick uh, this. So now it's this nice green color. And uh, we can just uh, add more to, uh, to draw, draw something. And the point is, so I mean here for the purpose, it's not, uh, I mean the exact shape does not matter at all. Uh, the point is only that um, you want your, your kind of two, two wires to go all the way to the, to the bottom, to the, to, the, to the part, and then you want this part to, uh, to be to be connected, and then if we can just select them uh, with Shift, we should be able to all change them to uh, superconducting aluminum, and they're all nice and green. Yes. And now the final thing that we need to do. Before we we, uh, we we set up and 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 our own simulation is that we have to define ports of our system, which are going to be 
some boundary conditions when we, we can ex externally input some, uh, some fields and, and uh, make things happen. And so we go to Tools, Add Port, and we're going to add port to the two sections of the circuit which uh, touch the boundary. So first port and tools add port, second port. And now we want to set up what type of uh, simulation we want to do. And this is done by going to analysis set up. Please stop me if I, I, I mean, I, I mean, it's quite simple, so I don't want to, to bore you by going too slow, but I, uh, so just, just stop me if there's any issue. Um, so analysis set up, and now we have the different types of, of um, kind of sweeps we can do. So, so the basic way that Sonnet uh, uh, does a simulation is going to a specific uh, frequency and then uh, simulate the response of the system. And uh, so this is, for instance, something like a linear frequency sp sweep. We go from one frequency to another frequency every, uh, every, every such distance. And, and, and uh, to kind of simplify the analysis of, of a circuit, and we might not exactly know which frequency might be the most interesting, there's a, a thing called uh, adaptive sweep, and then what it's going to do is that we just set up two, two, uh, two frequencies. So for instance, uh, here in the example, I set up two and 10 gigahertz. And then through the analysis, what it's going to do is measure a few points, but then um, somehow in a, a little bit uh, obscure way, uh, look at the, the derivative and, and kind of without resolving the problem at different frequencies, still be able to extract information. So this is going to be quite useful to just uh, get, the, get the right shape without actually simulating uh, uh, millions of points of different frequency. Now, there is an option at the top uh, left, which we're going to, to choose, which basically um, means that we... Um, um, when we do analysis, we don't throw away the information about uh, what's the different current at the different places. Uh, and then we can actually visualize this. And finally, uh, with the speed memory button, we can choose uh, exactly how much meshing uh, we want, which is going to be important for, for, for us because we have very limited amount of memory to, uh, to define our model. So uh, this is going to be able to kind of simplify the, 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 the kind of uh, meshing on our circuit uh, to be able to simulate it. So, but for this very, very, very simple, the fine meshing on the left should be fine. So we can click on estimate um, to, to, to have an idea. So first we have to save it. We're going to uh, uh, save it uh, anywhere. Okay, and then <laughs> even in this very, very, very simple uh, circuit, I'm already at five uh, megabytes, so over, over the limit for the, for the free uh, version. And if I click at sub subsection, I'm, I, I see how Sonnet chose to split the, the, the circuit. And, and then you can tell that, you know, it of, of course wants a little bit more, uh, uh, um, more sections that can carry different kind of, of, uh, of current near the, the point where there's some uh, discontinuity. And also, what you can tell is that it knows that you're going to do something at relatively high frequency. And because of the, the skin effect, current is going to propagate mostly on the, the, the sides of your conductor. So it actually wants to do a finer meshing on, on the sides than in the middle of the conductor. Um, but so for our purpose here, since the first, sorry, I didn't mean to do this. Since our first simulation, we want to be able to simulate even if we don't have a license, we're going to reduce a little bit the meshing to try and go below this one megabyte. And so should be able, maybe if you press the middle meshing to go to one megabyte. Yes. All right, and now we can finally 
finally launch our first very simple um, yes so you need to make sure so so that's a good point so so for the for the, for the way it works out the boundary condition you want to make sure that um, uh, zooming is a little bit painful. Uh, that the, the this port, the, the piece of metal exactly lines up with the border. And so it's exactly at a boundary condition where, where uh, it's grounded. So, you know, with, with uh, I guess with alt and uh, scrolling, you can zoom in and check that it's really the case. Otherwise, you move a little bit and you should be able to do it. Okay, so to run it, Go to project, analyze, and boom, we're running our first standard simulation. Um, all right. So, uh, so now we want to see to see what's uh, what's the result. And so, um, you know, we, ha we have to do everything from within this, uh, this, uh, this interface. So, go to project, view response, and we want to create a new graph. So, I'll scroll this down. Project, view response, new graph. And this gives us, um, so, S11 by default. So, so we, have, we have our graph going from 2 gigahertz to 10 gigahertz. We see that there's only three points where uh, Sonnet actually ran the full simulation, but it could get the right shape by kind of guessing and extrapolating. So, so because nothing very strange happens, it actually does get the right shape even though uh, with this adaptive sweep. And so now we, now we right now we're plotting kind of the magnitude of the response if we just send a signal from one side and see what happens. But what we're interested really is the uh, capacitance of the circuit. And to extract this, what we have to do is to go to equation, add equation curve. And there we can choose uh, from the scrolling menu capacitance number three, which is the capacitance between the two ports when all the op other ports, which don't exist for us, are open circuited. So this is so there's just multiple definition. And, and, and you can tell that uh, here it simply takes um, a certain uh, 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 algebraic function of um, the different bare uh, uh, response parameters that it extracts from the circuit. And from this, it's, it's able to, um, to construct the, the capacitance. And uh, we're going to put it on the left, so replacing this magnitude, which we're not interested in. And here we go. So we see um, that uh, we get a capacitance of 0.002 picofarad. And actually, maybe something that, uh, I mean, definitely for me, it was not uh, terribly intuitive. But we see there's a very slight frequency dependence on the capacitance. And OK, it's very, very slight, right? It's like the, it's the fourth, uh, fourth digit that changes. And so can somebody uh, venture an idea why uh, we actually should expect our capacitance to change with frequency? So OK, the point is that uh, uh, so we try to design something that looks like a capacitance, but of course uh, nothing's kind of pure capacitance. So in fact, if we look at our at our circuit, um, so we have a you know a little bit of wire, and then we have some things, and we're going to see some field uh, electric field developing between our two our two things our two uh, wire. But so you know we expect a little bit of electric field to develop between the two, but you know, we have little bits of wire, and then when we send in a high frequency um, uh, tone, uh, we're going to, to, uh, to have the, the um, current in the wire change qu quite rapidly, so we expect there to be a little bit of inductance. 
I mean, quite small compared to the capacitance because it, I mean, it's designed as a as a very uh, very um, cartoonish uh, um, capacitor, but it's going to be a little bit of inductance. And the point is that uh, if you if you go through the computations, um, since uh, in frequency the the um, so the impedance you expect out of a, out of a capacitor um, goes like um, minus i over omega c. It decreases with um, uh, with frequency. Um, okay, yeah, that's not really fun. So the point is the impedance of the so the reactance from the inductance we kind of cancel a little bit of. Uh, the the re reactance of the capacitance, which effectively will look like there's more uh, capacitance. So okay, so that was the first very very simple problem, and now um, uh, what we're going to do is uh, uh, try to simulate kind of the real uh, capacitance that we're interested in in our problem, which is our our little drum, and to do this uh, we're not going to um, uh, draw it from scratch, but actually we want to use the fact that uh, um, we can, from Sonnet, directly import uh, GDS files. So the GDS files are files where all the different layers of the process are defined. That, uh, that is a file that is created anyway when we want to do the, uh, the, the nanofabrication of a, of, a different, of a certain circuit. So when we want to make this circuit, we create this file and we can use exactly the same file to, uh, to, load, to load the, the geometry of our circuit with its sonnet. Except, of course, that this is not possible uh, in sonnet light. So you go to File, Import, and uh, you want to import a certain GDS and then you get this uh, very, very nice uh, error message that tells you that you should really spend the money and buy the real version. So for you, on the, on the um, uh, Google Drive, I put, I put a version of the, um, the geometry, which is basically right after uh, I've imported um, the, the geometry from, um, from the GDS file. So you should go, so you should see this Sonnet 1 folder and the drum import. Uh, sonnet file. And okay, there's an error message because uh, Sonnet kind of splits all the data and run simulation folder in a different folder and here I copy just the geometry so it knows there's something <coughs> wrong but it does not matter at all. So, so did you, could you open the, this geometry? Yes. And now, um, so we're going to do the same kind of trick. So, um, oh, okay. So, so, so really, we should uh, redefine. Yeah, maybe I should have given you uh, something already defined. So, uh, we can just uh, quickly uh, redefine uh, our layers, which is maybe not so interesting. But okay, for the purpose of the simulation, it's not that terribly important. But yeah, the point is that we have one more layer. So if you if you look at our geometry, so so now we have we have three uh, a stack of three dielectrics. The bottom is our is our uh, substrate. Then we have a first metallic layer, which is going to be the kind of um, bottom, the, the first patterning, the circuit, and now we have an upper layer where there's the top part of the drum. And of course, you know, if you look at our real circuit, um, right here, I mean, this part, the central bit, is the only part that's really higher. Everything else, the way it's fabricated, it's complicated, but uh, this will go to, to, to the bottom. Right, uh, um, but uh, so so here our model is not quite right, right? Because 
all this metal we model as being at the top. But really, the only place where it truly matters exactly where you are is, is at the capacitor itself when you have uh, the, the two plates and you, and you have strong uh, capacitance. So, so it's a little bit wrong, but it's not too bad. And now, um, what are we going to do is that um, we want to be able to simulate uh, multiple, um, right here. Um, yes, so we want to be able to, to simulate uh, multiple possible heights for the drum to see how does the capacitance change. Yes? How many? Yeah, is it finite? Is it like three or do you do as many as you like? So, um, I mean, we only need three. So what I, what I think is that, from what I understand, you can go as much as you like, but then uh, you might not be able to solve your system. I mean, it increases the size of the memory needed to solve the system. But I think they, they let you do how much you, you want to try. So you can do, I mean, for industry purposes, I guess it is important to be able to do many layers uh, with kind of very weird things happening uh, at different layers. So this is not a, a basic limitation, it's just how much memory the, the, the model will be. Yes? Um, so you're saying, ah, yeah, 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 you're saying, oh, I want a very special dielectric dial electric that I put only between the two parts of the drum, but not anywhere else. Yes, I think you, you cannot, uh, I mean, I might be mistaken, I have never looked into it, but I think at least the basic uh, sunnet is not a possibility. I mean, it's been, it might have been a... And it also kind of breaks the, the, the whole way it works by just solving for, for some uh, wave modes in a constant electric. So yeah, that's kind of, I guess, part of the trick why it's an easier problem to solve. So, yeah. And so actually even for, so I just looked at how many layers you can do and for the conductor layers, um, even for the gold version, you can use three. Um, and then there's the most expensive professional where you can use more than that, but then they, they still have some limitations. And so I guess even in, uh, in, uh, in an industrial use, <coughs> we don't use that many layers in general. Okay, so what we want to do is uh, define um, um, a, a parameter which is going to be, uh, so a variable, we'll go to circuit add variable, and this is going to be uh, the variable height of our uh, drum. Yes? Yes, I'm going to go back to this because I just need this variable. Uh, oh, one second. So, uh, so I go, I go say a gap, and I want to say to define it. For instance, uh, uh, 50 around 50 nanometer, which should be around what is this? So, 0 0.05 microns. And now, exactly uh, the, the point, uh, Mohammed, we go back to the dielectric layer. And now, instead of inputting a value, we can add our, our variable. And so we'll be able to run the simulation with different values for this uh, uh, variable. And uh, I mean, this is purely aesthetic, but uh, I can call this air. I can also call this air. And uh, I should put it about. All right, so now we have our, our, our little bit more complicated dielectric sandwich, and we'll be able to, to vary uh, the value of the gap. And uh, just to check, what's the metal? Uh, unknown metal, okay, so I mean, really, 
I guess it's fine. This unknown metal is, is uh, yeah, it's superconducting. So, okay, we don't need to worry about this. Yes? So, you have the electric voltage. Yes? Yeah, yeah, so I, I just inputted it. Yeah, it, so it doesn't matter so much for our purposes, but just the bottom layer, uh, I, I put uh, again 9.3 for the dielectric and uh, one, uh, uh, 10 to the minus 7 for the, for the, uh, the dielectric loss tangent, the same as before. It really does not really matter for our purposes. I, I probably should have given you the file already with defined uh, dielectrics. Um, okay, so now what we want to do is uh, define, uh, define the box and the cell. And so uh, we, we, we actually will want to draw a box such that the two little hands at the bottom are against the wall so that we can just put our ports there. Uh, so we'll just set the box size with mouse, the, the mouse, and I'll just draw some, uh, yeah, something like that. To be close to the two hands, press enter. So I just uh, redrew the bottom and then uh, just so that we can run it uh, not so easily. It's not the best for the quality of the simulation, but I'll increase the cell size to, uh, to, to two microns, right? Two microns, just so that it uses a little bit less uh, memory. So of course, I mean, yeah, in, uh, this is a little bit uh, rough because the, the size of our little line is, is about uh, two microns width. But uh, so in fact, you should do, we should go a little bit lower and check uh, exactly uh, uh, what's the right amount to, to get uh, uh, good results. But just for our purposes, that's going to be fine. And now I just want to be able to connect both to the wall, so I'm just going to add a little bit of of metal uh, at each port, just to go to go um, all the way to the wall. So to draw a rectangle, and I just add something that goes to the wall. This was for my top plate, so my my top layer. And now, if I go to the, my bottom layer, so my bottom layer <coughs> is. Uh, is uh, highlighted, I can just do the same. Okay, and as before, I'm going to add ports to uh, each layer. So at the bottom, I add the port to the wall and also at the top. <clears throat> yes, and now the kind of analysis that we're going to do is we want to sweep this gap to be able to extract what's the value of the capacitance at uh, different gap heights. Uh, I'm also going to compute currents just to show you quickly afterwards. Um, so I'm going to do a parameter sweep, and I add a parameter sweep, and uh, I want to sweep the gap going from uh, 20 nanometers, which is uh, physically a little bit unreasonably low, to uh, 100 nanometers uh, by steps of 0 0.5. And so this is the parameter will vary, and then for each value of the parameter, we have to choose what type of uh, sweep we want to do. And here, uh, we're just going to do a single, uh, single frequency analysis at uh, 5 gigahertz, which should, should be uh, around the um, resonant frequency of the circuit we're expecting. Yes? How did you get to this window? So, I went uh, to uh, analysis setup. Yeah. I wanted a parameter sweep and then I could add a parameter sweep. So this should be, uh, if you, well, it's now it's in the corner, but yeah, okay. 
it's maybe not over there. Yes? Um, be aware, yes, I'm aware. Um, so uh, once again, before we can run simulation, we have to save it somewhere. So uh, we can save it somewhere. And we can, uh, okay, let's just check how much memory it takes us. And I guess now <laughs> most of you uh, won't be able to do it. Okay, so with these rough cells, I get five uh, megabyte when I go to the finer mesh. So if I go to a little bit rougher mesh, mm, still three megabytes, might be, might be rough. Yeah, so uh, sorry for the people who have uh, seen it light. It's still quite good for everybody else, but we can see. So if we look at the, the subsection, we see it's not very, very good because, okay, we have like a single, uh, yeah, I guess you can kind of see. So we have a, like a single width. We cannot take any into account any, um, anything that is due to the fact that the current will, might not go uniformly uh, through the wire. And okay, we have a certain amount of uh, resolution uh, of the drum capacitor itself. Excuse me? And how can you watch the mesh? Ah, yeah. So once you've done the estimate, it gives you a uh, megabyte, how much subsection, and you can click here, view subsections. Uh, so, so probably you, you uh, so when you go to circuit box, you need to find the minimum cell size uh, that's not too small. So yeah, I chose on purpose something a little bit large so that the memory should not be too big. All right, and we can run our, um, our model. It should still be quite fast. And now, uh, if we want to go to, to check the response, we go to um, uh, view response, uh, new graph. Uh, it opened it in the other window. All right. Uh, and now, by default, what it does is plotting in with respect to frequency. So it chooses one parameter value, and it plots uh, respect to frequency, which is not what we want. What we want is to be able to plot over the gap. So we go to graph, plot over, parameter. And now, uh, OK, it, it asks us to to, 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 to plot a certain, uh, certain thing, uh, like a certain uh, response. Uh, so we just choose one of them from the list and put them on the right, uh, which is, we're going to change it anyway. Uh, so, all right, we have the, we have the three values for the, for the height, which we simulated. But now we see this magnitude of the response, which is not very interested. So once again, we go to equation curve, and we choose um, capacitance 3, which is the, the, what we're more interested in. So I guess, yeah, only a few of you have the result of the simulation. So. Um, and now what you can see is, OK, we, we run, in, uh, run it on over only very few uh, points. Um, um, Maybe I can, but anyway, it doesn't matter. So what, what do we expect? We have parallel plate capacitor, yes? Okay, we have parallel plate capacitor, we vary the thickness, we're expecting the capacitance to go like one over uh, this thickness. I mean, it's pretty good. <laughs> we can add more points, we'll see. I mean, in, in, it does, it does uh, have uh, at least the, the right uh, uh, qualitative feature. We could do something more quantitative. And just to think about it, so now we're uh, much larger capacitance than we drew before. So we're about around 0.2 uh, picofarad. And of course, um, so what do, you, what do we want out of the circuit, right? We want uh, the drums to be, to be, to be quite um, uh, thin, so uh, this small gap, so that we have large capacitance. And the slope 
of the capacitance change as a function of distance is large because this in the end is going to be our coupling like how, how small fluctuation of the distance can I translate to capacitance fluctuation and to uh, frequency fluctuation. So this concludes uh, my first, the, the first part. So I went a little bit over time, uh, uh, which does not uh, matter too much. I, I'll just, um, it's, it's okay. So, so for instance, um, the exercise that suggests with respect to this, uh, to this section, which uh, is possible to do even if you only have, uh, you don't have the license, is this first very simple capacitor or any capacitor uh, what happens at uh, at much larger frequency? So we saw that the capacitance was increasing a little bit, a little bit. And okay, I hinted that this might have something to do with the effective inductance of the circuit. But now, um, uh, what I suggest is that you simulate it to much higher uh, frequency, so up to hundreds of uh, gigahertz. See what happens with respect to the capacitance, and uh, think about it if it makes sense or it doesn't make sense. So, uh, any, any questions before I go to the second, uh, what I intended as the kind of the second uh, lecture? Yes? Uh, it had slightly different, slightly different capacitance for the, for the results. Ah. I was wondering how the, how the box size or the attachment of the or how that changed the results. Well, uh, I mean, ideally, it shouldn't, uh, it shouldn't matter too much. So, I mean, here, of course, we, we chose quite rough. Um, um, so, so, yeah, we chose quite rough um, uh, cell size such that depending where the drawing sits with respect to this, uh, uh, to this size, then the actual sh uh, uh, simulated shape will change, right? So it's not a regime that's, that's very nice. Um, yeah, so ideally, normally you, you want to have cell size a little bit smaller so that it doesn't matter too much. So one thing I forgot, which might be uh, interesting. So since we did simulate the currents, what we can see is uh, visualize, you know, how do the charge accumulate on, uh, on our circuit. So if we go to project, view currents. Okay, no problem. Uh, now we get this picture, and so what what what, what happens is that um, um, so we get our circuit, and then the color will correspond to how much current there is um, in our circuit. And the very annoying thing is that by default uh, you have no idea what's the scale. And if you want the scale, you go to uh, uh, plot scale. And then you see it's automatically adjusted between two values. Uh, and so the problem, so what's the main problem? Is that, uh, okay, I want, okay, here parameter, I can, I can change the parameter. For instance, I can go to 70. And then I see that the colors basically didn't change. But it could just be because it got rescaled by some different number. So, so really, if I want to, to, to compare things, I should uh, go to the scale, fix it, and then I can uh, compare what happens. But so this is, the, this is the current, and what I'm a little bit more interested uh, for my um, capacitor is to look at the charge. So if I go to plot, response, charge, here I can tell that, I can see that uh, basically, as I expect, there's some quite large charges relatively speaking, that develop in the center part of the circuit uh, with respect to the rest. And the, I mean, and I can tell it's really uh, behaving as a, as a capacitor. So if that's all right, then I'm going to try to move a little bit forward and tell you a few things about um, what I wanted to talk next, which is um, <coughs> The, the limits of the lumped element model. Um, so, 
so like I said before, so we have our circuit, and uh, you know, we have some complicated shapes, some wires, so this, this drum, and then we're like, okay, but this complicated shape of the wire, I can sum up this whole behavior by just one parameter L. And this drum, I can sum up this whole parameter by, by C, uh, by one value. And what does it mean, really? What it means is that you're thinking for each element that, uh, okay, you, you went to the, the Fourier, um, went to Fourier transform, you go to each side, each side of the element and you say, I can define a voltage. And this is a voltage that's uh, true for uh, all the points. So kind of all the points on my drum will feel the same voltage. And then there's going to be some oscillations in the field, in the, sorry, in the, in the current. And everywhere it's going to be the same current. So this is maybe more valid for an inductor. You have this long wire and you're saying, oh, all through this wire I'm going to get the same current I. And then I get this linear relationship between U and I, and I have this uh, effective uh, impedance, and I'm happy I'm, I sit in the lumped element. And of course, that might not hold. Um, when should that not hold? Uh, so in case of doubt, uh, 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 always go back uh, to the Feynman lectures. So uh, in, in this uh, chapter uh, 23, there's this very, very nice uh, uh, um, kind of a continuous transition that Feynman uh, uh, suggests to think about. Uh, when, uh, when we start from this very simple uh, LC uh, resonator, we have some wire in which all the magnetic field of the problem is confined. So, so, so this is defined a region where there's magnetic field and, and uh, some constant magnetic field for a kind of constant current over the region. And then a second region where all our electric field is confined, and this is uh, the capacitor. And so there's a certain uh, voltage, some charges, and there's this nice uh, uniform um, electric field. Um, and this is when the lumped element model is valid. Like here I can just sum everything up by one value L, here I can sum up everything by value C. I have a defined place where I have my magnetic field, a defined place where I have my electric field. Now what Feynman, uh, Richard Feynman suggests to do is uh, let's try to increase the resonance frequency of our oscillator. And to do this, uh, we can just reduce the inductance because the uh, uh, resonance frequency goes like 1 over uh, square root of LC. So what do we do to reduce our inductance? We know we had something with many loops. We just keep a single loop. So we have our capacitor here and we have just a single loop, which should have much less inductance than many loops. And then we actually put many of those loops in parallel. And by putting them in parallel, you divide the, the, um, the effective impedance and effectively you, uh, you reduce the effective inductance. And now you kind of get this, uh, this circuit, much higher frequency. And so you will have some electric field between the two plates. And now you, you kind of have this magnetic field just going around in loops right outside the, the capacitor. So you kind of put things closer and closer together. So the boundary between electric fields and, and magnetic fields is kind of much lo more loosely uh, defined. And then one more step in the limit is saying, OK, I put so many of those inductors that actually it's, it's just a continuous metallic wall that I've built around my, um, uh, my capacitor. And so, uh, so, of course, much less uh, inductance. And then I imagine that I still kind of have my electric field defined in the middle and my magnetic field going in loop in kind of this. Uh, this. So you imagine that this, is, uh, this figure is rotated around the vertical axis. And, and, and then finally, you, you reduce the size of those two, uh, of those um, kind of wings to nothing, and you're just left with this box. And in this box, there's both electric fields, which are vertical, and magnetic fields, which goes around. And this is, of course, higher frequency yet again. And you're in the situation where you have both electric fields and the magnetic field at the same place. And this should be expected from, from Maxwell equation, because 
uh, you know, as you know, you know, if you have some electric field that oscillates at quite a high frequency, then the oscillations of the electric fields create uh, uh, magnetic fields, and then, and then again, the magnetic fields create electric fields. Um, so you expect the electric fields and magnetic fields to share space. But, but what is it? This is just the fact that you basically have a wave, you know, that, that's how you simply, un one can simply understand uh, um, the, uh, the Maxwell equations. Like, uh, I mean, at some point, the wave nature of, of um, electrodynamics uh, becomes important. And in a way, that sums up the whole issue, is that the, <clears throat> uh, the lumped element picture is valid, as long as the, the wave nature is not important, as long as the scale of our, of our circuit is small compared to the distance traveled by light in a, in a typical time. Uh, so that it's true that the field is the same everywhere in the doctor and the uh, current is the same, and the field is the same everywhere in the capacitor and so forth. And so, okay, this is just sum up. So, the lumped element is valid as long as the size of my circuit is very small compared to the wavelength lambda. And uh, what's, what's lambda for, for our microwave circuit? So uh, uh, we we're thinking about roughly uh, 5 gigahertz. The speed of light in some uh, transmission line is roughly, uh, the speed of waves is roughly uh, one half, the order of uh, one half the, the speed of light. And you find that, okay, the scale you're working at is, uh, you should worry about is about three centimeters. And if you think back about our circuit, um, <clears throat> it's quite small, right? So we have the inductors. Um, maybe I'll, uh, I'll just show you back the picture. But um, uh, so if I think of the scale here, it's, you know, a few hundreds of microns, so, so tens of, uh, of millimeter. Um, so it's still pretty small compared to centimeters, but we're getting there. And I mean, th this kind of breakdown of the lumped element, you, you should start to, to expect it when the dimensions are like a tenth maybe of the wavelength, so like three millimeters. And then if you think that, okay, it's hundreds of microns, but it wire, the wire just bends around, uh, uh, maybe you'll, you'll see something happening. And so you have to, to worry about. And this is why it's, it's, uh, it makes sense to simulate the whole circuit rather than just uh, estimate through independent uh, 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 ways how much inductance and how much capacitance you should have and then just uh, compute what, what, you want, what you expect the resonance frequency to be. And so uh, we're going to uh, think about this. So uh, the simple example that uh, we're going to work with is just a loop, so an inductance, and then we're going to try to change the size of the loop you know, until uh, the lumped element picture breaks down, and then we'll, we'll try to understand uh, what, what it implies. So let's load, uh, s normally I should have given you a, a model already more or less built because it takes a little bit more time to just try to um, draw it, even though it's quite simple. So yes, yeah, this wire inductor model. And uh, I predefined the material, so that's good. We don't have to do it uh, here. So what do I want to do? Uh, yet again, I'm just going to um, uh, Interface. Okay, uh, just going to define two ports at the two ends of my wire, which are already inside the ground wall, so no need to worry about this. And what I want to do is to be able to change the size of this loop and make it so big that uh, it kind of reaches the, the limits of, uh, of validity. And to do this, I'm going to go to Tools. Um, all right. So tools, add dimension parameter, um, and uh, anchored. And so what we're going to do, so we're going to define a point that doesn't move. So, so we want to increase the size of the loop 
uh, with respect to a certain point. So this point, which doesn't move, is going to be one of those points there, for instance, right? All right, okay. And now, and now we're going to say which point moves with respect to that. So, okay, it's really small. All right, so I picked this point on the inside. So what I want to do is, is make the point at the same vertical, uh, at the same horizontal height move with respect to this. Okay, so I'm going to click. This is as a reference point that should move. And then, of course, when this point moves, I want the whole top bar to move. So I need to select, uh, actually, all those points which define the... Um, uh, all right. So all those points. So the, the two... So, so I, need to, I want to select the two top points of this bar and the two left points of this bar, which, for reasons of not drawing very well, don't actually quite correspond. Um, and then on the right, I want to do the same. So I want that all those points should move up when, uh, when it moves. And here, for instance, you see that I chose kind of a rough um, cell size compared to the thing, and then it, it doesn't quite match, right? So, so the drawing was kind of a little bit off, but the actual metal that's going to be simulated has snapped back to the grid, which is simulating. So I should have everything, click enter, and then I'm calling this uh, length. It's very original. Move the points the same distance, that should be fine. I already have a length defined for some reason. And, uh, okay. and then I just can, can choose to put this uh, visual representation of this quantity there. And now the, the, the check that uh, I didn't do a mistake is I double click on, on this length. I set another value, for instance, 500 microns. And then I check that everything moved the right way and I don't get some uh, horrible uh, deformation. Yes? Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, all right, let's do this. Um, so this is, should be the Google Drive. So this PDF 2, right? So Sorry? It's good? Yes? Okay, so now uh, we're ready to simulate this inductance as a function of our, um, of our kind of loop size. So uh, we go to analysis, setup, and uh, we're also going to compute currents. It's going to be interesting and now uh, we go to parameter sweep add and the parameter that we're varying is this length number two and uh, okay what did I suggest go to from uh, 200 uh, to something quite large like 1600 every 200 and Uh, and let's do this. Let's do this already. We're going to check two um, two different frequency for for this. One gigahertz and um, and five gigahertz. So we're just a single step. Okay. Uh, okay, speed memory. Yeah, this is going to be too much for uh, for the for the unregistered license. But uh, ah, or maybe barely. It looks like it's uh, it's barely good if you go to the roughest 
um, the roughest uh, uh, meshing for the it 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 should be one megabyte. So you can you can try this. Um, uh, well, yeah, I don't I don't have problem. I'll just run it like this. So it should give some similar results. And now I can run the analysis. So still not too slow. <clears throat> yes? Sorry, what did you get? Uh, okay, okay. Um, no, no, but be careful. Be careful. There's, yeah. there's uh, three different uh, roles. Okay. There's the uh, anchored point, which doesn't mm -hmm. move. There's the point which will move with respect to this anchored point. Mm -hmm. And then there's other points which will move as the reference point. So actually, you want to set the second point right above. So the one above, not the one on the side, yes, exactly. Yeah. Otherwise it would, it, it would move diagonally, okay. right? But then I do this. Uh, um, and you have to set up... Okay, uh, you didn't select all the points. Yeah, more than two so, I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's not very well drawn, but there's, there's the two, each time there's the two top points of the vertical rectangles, but there's the two left and the two right of the top rectangle. See what I mean? Where should be? So, yeah. This? And this? And this? Yes, and, and also uh, the top one. Also this guy? Yeah, yeah. I mean, okay, it's not the, okay. maybe the cleanest example, but yeah. <clears throat> All right. So we have our simulation, and we're going to look what happens. So view response, new graph. It opens in the other window. We don't want to see the data with respect to the frequency, but rather with respect to the parameter. Um, and now uh, this is the, the thing. So. So okay, we need to choose one thing we want to plot, and then and then since we're running um, with respect to frequency, we need to choose one. Sorry, sorry, we're plotting with respect to the parameters of the length. We need to choose a given frequency. So here uh, we will choose uh, one gigahertz. Um, very good, and okay, we see some 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 weird of the response, but what we actually want is the the inductance. So we go to equation, add curve, and, and select inductance 3, which is the inductance between port 1 and 2. Okay. This is what we see. What do we expect? <laughs> so we have a loop. Uh, we have a loop. We're uh, linearly increasing the size of the loop. This should uh, linearly increase the size of the magnetic flux defined within a loop, so we roughly, um, we roughly expect the inductance to scale linearly. Kind of, not 100% quite, but kind of. Now, uh, what happens, sorry, what happens at, uh, this, is was, uh, this was at 1 gigahertz. Now, what happens at um, at 5 gigahertz, so I go to the right axis, I select something random, and here I want to select uh, 5 gigahertz. So this is, of course, the, one of the silliest user interface ever produced, but I want to select the 5 and make it go bottom, I guess. Okay. Now I'll get this weird response on the right, which is not what I want. 
Uh, so add the equation curve, I also want induction 3 on the right. Did I do something silly? Ah, OK, no, I, I did something silly. So what I, the only thing I should have done is go to equation curve. Uh, I won't add it on the right. And here, when I, when I say I want to plot the inductance, here I should select uh, 5 gigahertz. So I redo this very tricky selection of making the 5 go down. OK, and this should be fine. OK. Now, definitely, this is not linear, right? So at 1 gigahertz, we see this rough linear dependence. And then at 5 gigahertz, the same exact shape, we want to extract how much inductance it has. Um, it, it, it starts bending down. Like, we increase the size of the loop, and the inductance goes down. Very, very strange. Um, and of course, this is because uh, at 5 gigahertz, the wavelength is smaller, and now the size of the loop becomes uh, 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 of an order uh, comparable with the, um, with the wavelength. And to be able to visualize this, we can go to, sorry, we can go to uh, project, uh, no, sorry, I selected the wrong project. So this is the one we're interested in, project view currents. And the currents appeared on a different node. All right. <clears throat> OK. So now we can see uh, how much current there is on the line. So, so OK, we see that when we run at uh, 1 gigahertz for a length of 200, we have um, Yeah, okay, you can tell that actually it looks a little bit so okay, so here you can see the um, sorry, so here you can see the, the this kind of skin skin effect, right? That the current actually wants to travel only on the outside of the wire. So if you actually meshed it less, uh, uh, then it's a little bit more visible what's going on. So so here here you kind of see it's red everywhere, but it's actually just the sides of the of the wire. Now, what happens when uh, we take the same length, but we look at 5 gigahertz? It looks quite similar. We also just uh, the current everywhere in the loop. Uh, we go back to 1 gigahertz, and now we want to see a very large loop. So we look at plot parameters, and now we can check the, the largest size. So we have the largest size loop at 1 gigahertz, and OK, we have this beautiful uh, constant current on our whole uh, loop. Uh, this is kind of red everywhere. But if, if we now select 5 gigahertz, what are we going to see? We're going to see that okay, this depends on the exact boundary condition used to, to, to compute this. You can actually change it. But here, basically, it, it's kind of stimulating from port 2 and checking what happens. So I'm stimulating on port 2. I'm creating uh, a current, and a current, a current, a current, and then uh, current disappears. So the whole length of my wire now starts to be comparable to um, um, what it should be a quarter, uh, quarter wavelength, right? Because at the quarter wavelength, I expect to go from a maximum to zero. And now I understand why I get a lower inductance than, uh, than expected, because this part, cr as a current, creates a magnetic field. So as the energy, uh, uh, the energy that, that, um, that's created by the magnetic field, so the inductance. But this part at all, this part does not have any current. It's not acting at all like an inductance. Yes? It's just, it's, just, um, it's just a wave. Here, if you want, here you kind of have some uh, charge accumulating and, and, and increasing up and down. It's really, it's, really, I mean, you, it's really some kind of standing wave. Here, I'm just like shaking the currents, you know, or like a, um, and I'm kind of creating some kind of standing wave. And, and over there, there's just 
the, the wave as, as uh, the information of the wave is contained in the, in the charge. So uh, sometimes it's not quite easy to see, but you, you should, s if you look at the charge, yeah. So here the charges, you see that there's much more charges here than there. Right? Here is, sorry, oops, what did I do? Here is, it's 100% current, no charges, and then more and more and more no charges. And here we just saw that there's no, I mean, the, you know, you kind of this wave traveling, but this wave is, is kind of not associated with variation of the currents, it's variation with, uh, associated with variation of the local charge. It's not that the current is uh, absorbed, it's just, it's a wave. There's a wave that propagates that with a certain boundary condition. And so this is the point. So, uh, so now I'm, I'm actually reaching the end. So I have one more example, which I I'll guess I'll, I'll, I'll just suggest to do as, a, as an exercise. Um, <clears throat> so the point is, um, if you are in the lumped element uh, 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 regime, you know, you, you have this, this element. And basically, if you, if, you, if you put a certain voltage, you know what's going to happen. There is a linear relationship between voltage and, uh, and, and current. If you put a certain current, you're going to develop a certain voltage and vice versa. When you are beyond this limit, this is not quite true. I mean, the, 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 how much this is going to act as an inductor kind of depends on the boundary condition, right? Here, I have a boundary condition where I'm shaking the current at the port two, and so there's a certain uh, pattern of the, of the, um, of the current which is going to correspond to a certain magnetic field and so in certain effective inductance. But depending what's the boundary condition here, the kind of standing wave shape will change and so the effective inductance of my uh, circuit uh, will vary. And I, and, I can kind of, and I kind of go back to this uh, picture of, uh, of Feynman is that um, now you can kind of think of this as a, as a, as a kind of a boundary condition problem. You, you know, in, in, in the very generic case, you're trying to solve, and this is what Sonnet does when you, when you give it a certain model, you're trying to solve what is going to be the electromagnetic mode in shape, in, uh, shape in space, and this is going to depend on the boundary condition. So, you know, if you give it a, if, if you give it a wire, <coughs> A priori, it wants to, to put, to put uh, a current in the wire. And if you have some two parallel plate, then uh, charges will develop. And so, you know, if here I just put two parallel plates, then I'm going to get those nice charges developing. And then the, the, the current is going to be, um, you know, I'm going to have most of my current here, far from, body, uh, from my kind of charge boundary condition. So I'm going to have some magnetic field and current here, and then slowly it develops from current to charges. Um, so this is, um, so, so okay, I had one more example, which was um, importing the whole circuit uh, uh, um, of a single LC resonator. I, I will actually let you work on this as an exercise. There's just a, a, a one step which is important uh, which we haven't done uh, together, which is the fact that we have this top and bottom metallic plate and we need to uh, uh, connect them. And so this is done... Um, <coughs> okay, if, if, if for instance, this was not my... if it was not my capacitor, but was the point where I wanted to connect bottom and top layer, uh, then I would add uh, tools add a via. Uh, and here we see that there's two choices. Uh, it's either goes down or goes up. So if we chose goes down, I'm going to first select my top layer, then go tools, add, add via, uh, draw a rectangle, and I, and I can some, draw something. And this little square, it's going to be uh, um, at the same uh, voltage, basically, as my top. So, so I'm allowing currents to flow up and down through these squares, which I'm to, going to need to to make my uh, LC circuit uh, work. So if you have questions, you can, you can come back later. Um, so, so that's it. So I, as kind of uh, suggested exercises, I would uh, suggest that you, you play. So, so you, you take this LC mode, you try to get to find uh, some, some resonance. 
and then uh, uh, what I would like to do is, to suggest is you know you look at the current and the, sh the shape of the modes of the, of the the resonance where there's current where there's charges and and see if it exactly corresponds to what you expect from the damped element picture of a LC resonator or not and then there's two things you can do you can try to simulate at higher frequency where um, basically um, you're going to get the higher order mode which is saying that from going from charge to instead of going from charge to current to charge you go to charge current charge current charge you kind of have one more wavelength uh, or one more half wavelength in in the path so just simulate higher frequencies see what happens see if you can find a higher order mode and the other thing you can do is start playing with the, the, the shape of this LC circuit by increasing the size of the, of the inductor until you kind of break this uh, lumped element uh, 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 limit and then you, you start the in, to see the inductor not act quite as an inductor even for the fundamental mode. So with this, I, I'm sorry I had to, to eat, uh, I ate a little bit of the, of the coffee break, but uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. And if you have any last quick questions, or actually we can do it during the, the coffee break if you have questions.